beautiful. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Would you stand as we open our service in prayer? Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise for this good day. Lord, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so, Lord, as we worship you today, may you be glorified in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you turn now to hymn number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Let us profess our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we would normally receive our morning offering, but as you know, we're uh, having our buckets at the door where you can drop your offering, or you can go online at templeonline.org and give your tithe and your offering there. Uh, we have a lot of things to celebrate. Uh, last 
uh, week, we had 14 people go through Discover the Temple class. That's our basically our membership class, our one-day membership class. And, and so we'll be looking forward to several of them uh, coming into membership. We had another class today. I'm not sure how many people are in there now, but uh, probably quite a few. And so it's exciting to do that. Uh, this morning at the service that happened right before uh, this, we had four new members join. And so let's just give glory to God and thanks and praise for that. Amen. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. And we got more coming in the future. And so let's just thank the Lord for all that he's given. Everything that we have. You woke up this morning. That's a gift. You know what? If you didn't wake up this morning, that'd still be a gift. Amen, Peter? That's right. And, you, and I want you to know, God is a good God. He blesses us immensely, abundantly, far more than we ask, think, or possibly imagine. And so let's thank him because he is the source of everything. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord God. Your love, your love is beautiful. Your love is powerful. Oh God, I just thank you for how you pour out your blessings upon your children. Lord, you never leave us, never forsake us. You're always there with us. You provide everything that we need. And so, oh God, as the source of all of, of, all, all, of, of all of our blessing, we thank you for everything that you are to us and what you do for us. And so, Lord, strengthen us to be givers, generous people who love to help, who love to strengthen, who love to give out of a heart of joy. In Jesus' name. There is a Savior, what joys express, His eyes are mercy, His words rest for each tomorrow. For 
So we're going to now sing This Is My Father's World on page 144. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. So if you'll stand and join us in singing this hymn.
beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a great day to be alive, isn't it? Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful day outside. I hope you all are enjoying the weather before it gets scorchingly, mind-bendingly hot. So, I'm going to just plant a little seed here and ask you to consider inviting somebody for Easter. You know, one of the things that research tells us is that 82% of people who are invited by someone that they know come to church on Easter Sunday when they, when they are asked by someone that they know. And so I invite you to do that. I hope you'll do that. We've been through a lot of chaos in the past year, haven't we? <laughs> we think about the chaos. We've been through COVID chaos. We've been through hurricane chaos. We've been through other hurricane chaos. We've been through election chaos. We've been through impeachment chaos. We've been impeachment sequel chaos. We've been through winter storm chaos and power grid in Texas chaos. We, we've been through a lot. Of the, I'm, the only thing we're missing is the shark NATO where the sharks come out and they're like a tornado. That's the only chaos that we're missing and I don't want to jinx it by saying anything but you know, we've been through a lot. A lot of things have been canceled over the last year. But one thing that we know that will not and cannot be canceled is the promise that God will take care of you, his people. That's the promise. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to, even to the end of the age. That's his promise. And that's a promise because oftentimes when our faith begins to falter, that's when fear begins, a, gets, begins to get a foothold. And oftentimes we need to remember this, this simple point, and it's this. Don't interpret the presence of problems as the absence of God. And that's my, really, my only point today. One point, and that's it going to hover over it like a buzzard maybe that's not a good image but you know maybe a plane I'm going to and we're going to go round and round on this and actually if you got that point you can go home now you can go to brunch you can still get to Luby's early so it's good before the Baptists get in you're, you're good but don't interpret the presence of problems as the absence of God we've been talking about reversing the curse and we've been in Genesis chapter Three, and we've been talking about the origin of the curse, origin of all of this chaos and all of this conflict that is in the world. And we talked last week about how Satan tempted Eve and Adam in the garden. And he basically uh, said to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, this was the only command that God had given them, mind you. It was the only command that God gave. He says, do not eat from this one tree. Out of all the trees in the garden, you can eat from anything, but don't eat from this one. Because our God is not a God of limitation. He's not a God of restriction. He's a God of freedom. And he's a God that says, you can eat of any of these, but just not this one. And as I said last week, the reason why God did that was because he wants us to freely choose to love him or not love him. He doesn't want us to be robots. He doesn't want us to just be programmed to love him and only love him. He wants us to make a choice. And so the tree in the garden represented a choice. Love God or not love God. Follow God or not follow God. And of course we know what happened with Adam and Eve. They, they chose incorrectly. They made the choice. They sinned and chaos and conflict entered the world. And it continues to this day. In fact, it's the number one reason that most, that for many people, why they don't believe in God. It's the number one reason why for many people, they think that God is harsh or mean. Because they look at the chaos and the conflict in the world and they say, if God's such a good God, then why? And honestly, that's a good point. It is a good point. It's a good question. But I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, if you brought your Bibles with you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw, meaning Eve, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also devour, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. So why did she do it? Because she's just like you and me. She was deceived. Satan got her to desire something that we weren't supposed to be desiring and she gave into it. 
She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So her poor defenseless husband just wanted to be a good guy and, and just kind of, you know, be there for his wife and just trying to be supportive, you know, joined in, right? Well, not exactly. Adam, at any time, he saw this going on. At any time, he could have said to the serpent, get away from my wife. But he didn't do that. And see, God's love language is obedience. And when they cross the threshold of obedience into disobedience, they unleashed chaos and conflict throughout the world. They set a, a chain of events in motion that brought all of this into the world. And if you look at verse 7, it says, then the eyes of both of them were open. Now, I want you to notice what the first thing that they do when their eyes are open. Because remember, Satan had told them, he said, you'll be like God, your eyes will be open if you eat of this. He says, then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And I said last week that Satan always shows the bait, but he hides the hook. And honestly, this is a, a half-truth. He tells them a half-truth. He says, oh, he said, you will, um, you, your eyes will be open. But he doesn't tell them what they're going to see once their eyes are open. Well, I said last week there are some things that people just shouldn't see. I had a friend who was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and when he came to me one day, he said, there's some things that I've seen that nobody should have ever seen. Some things that we weren't meant to to see and sin enters the world and now everything has changed and you may have noticed I have this wooden uh, pillar here up here this is uh, the giant Jenga game if you've ever heard of that and it's where you, you usually have different slots here and you're trying to pull the block out without making it fall and sin is kind of like this giant Jenga, Jenga pillar it's, it's in, at any time if you pull from the bottom everything comes tumbling down and that's exactly what happens that's why we call it the fall Every, I can't underscore it, I can't underline it, I can't bold typeface it enough that we, everything changes because of Adam and Eve's sin. Every relationship changes because of the fall. Husband and wife, that relationship. Our relationship to God, to our neighbor, friendships, nation to nation, everything changes including our relationship with ourself. Our relationship with ourselves completely changes uh, because the first thing they did is cover up. They sewed fig leaves together and cover up because they were ashamed of themselves. They were ashamed of their own bodies. And, and now their confidence in themselves are completely shattered. You see, when God created them, they were created to live forever. They were created to live at peace with God. They were in, in harmony and walking with God. That's what they would do, walking with the Lord God in the cool of the day. And, and that's what they would do. They were created to be at harmony with each other in relationship, not just a marital relationship, but all relationships. They were created for that. No games, no, no hiding, no pretending, no defensiveness, no, no feelings of rejection complete total honesty and acceptance and supportive of themselves they know who they are and now all of that is gone all of that is ruined why because sin has entered the world look at verses 8 through 10 it says then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now I want you to notice this because some people would be like, what's this about? What, what, who is the Lord God walking, God's walking through the garden? How is that possible? This is one of the moments that you see in scripture where Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. Did you know that? Jesus shows up many times in the Old Testament. Another time is when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar looks in the, into the fiery furnace, he says, I see the three men, uh, uh, the three young Hebrew boys, and I see a fourth one who looks like the Son of God. He was in the fire with them. Multiple times throughout the Old Testament, the pre-incarnate Jesus shows up. Before Jesus is, comes to the earth, born as a baby, born of the Virgin Mary, but before he grows a beard and becomes a man, he shows up in the Old Testament. And this is one of those times. And the, but the Lord God called 
to the man, to Adam. He said, where are you? And you know, a lot of times we take that as something like he's yelling at them. He's like, like a sheriff saying, come on, come out with your hands up. But that's, I don't interpret it that way. He's concerned. He's worried about them. Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Verse 11, the Lord says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, I can already see that some of you, your wheels are turning and smoke's coming out. And you're thinking about this because you're going, now, wait a minute. If God is an all-knowing God, then why is he asking a question that he already knows the answer to? That's a great question. And the reason God asked the question is it's similar to a rhetorical question. You see, whenever God asks a question in any of the scripture, including when Jesus asked the question, it's not to start an interrogation. It's to stage an intervention. Did you see that? It's not to start an interrogation. It's to stage an intervention. I believe what the Lord God is doing here is he's actually giving Adam grace. He's offering grace to him. He's offering an opportunity to repent and show remorse for what he's done. And I think, I don't know how this would work. I don't know what God would have done. But had he done it, maybe things would be different. I don't know. But he asked Adam. And of course, Adam replies in a way that it's kind of funny and kind of sad it's actually it's so much like us isn't it It, it's so rich it's so choice the man said you ready the woman that you gave me right she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it so he blames Eve and then he turns around and blames God he said I didn't I didn't give her to me you gave her to me I just went to sleep one night woke up and there she is if you hadn't given her to me I wouldn't be in this mess you see we're already about four pages into the Bible and people are already throwing other people under the bus They're already saying the blame. They're always passing the buck. And we've been doing it ever since, haven't we? And see, again, God offers the opportunity, I think, to repent and show remorse to Eve. God says to the woman in verse 13, he says, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So here we have Adam blaming Eve and God. And we've got Eve blaming the serpent and so the blame game begins and it continues to this day we see it all around it's not my fault I didn't do anything in fact if I did it it's because so and so made me do it if they hadn't have done that then I wouldn't have done this self-preservation self-justification all of that begins to come into the world and thus conflict and chaos come into the world and ruin relationships Because sin has entered the picture. And make no mistake about it, this is what sin does. Sin destroys, sin divides, and sin always disappoints. Why? Because sin never delivers on what its promises are. Sin destroys relationships between people because it destroys trust. It destroys relationship with God because it builds a wall between us and a holy God. And the next verse really shows us in verse 14 that God is all-powerful because it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals, and you will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now before this, we don't really know how the serpent got around, but at this point he's going to be crawling around on the floor of the ground in the desert eating dust, basically. And here's something that I cannot emphasize more strongly than this sin always has consequences sometimes we see it sometimes we don't sometimes it's immediate sometimes it's not but sin always has consequences and in verse 16 God begins to explain I believe it's really to explain to Eve what the consequences are for the actions because of sin it says to the woman he said I will make your pains in childbearing very severe With painful labor, he says it again, with painful labor you will give birth to children. So ladies, you have Eve to thank for that. When you get to heaven, you can look her up and pay her a visit and have a little conversation. But I want you to notice something. 
this is not a direct punishment from God. You see, the word there where it says, I will make, I will make your pains in childbirth and labor hard. That word actually means two different things in the Hebrew. One is it means, I will cause this to happen. And the other is, I will allow the circumstances to continue. And in this case, it's more like I will allow the circumstances to continue because see, sin, the consequences of sin are a byproduct of sin. Sin has the consequences already built into it. It's already there. And so we, when we sin, we go against the way that God says to go. God is one way. And when we go one way, we go with God. And God says, if you go the opposite way, it's like going down a one-way street the opposite way. You're going to get hurt. And it's not that God sends the truck your way. It's that that's the way that sin works. It has its seeds of its own self-destruction. I'll give you an example. Let's say, I, and I really do, this is true, I like tortilla soup. And I never liked tortilla soup until I moved to Texas. And I'm a convert. So I love tortilla soup. I love to put the, av- the, the avocado in there and the, you know, because it's good for you. And, and, and sour cream and the tortilla strips. Now y'all are going to go to Chili's, aren't you? You're on your way to Chili's. And, and let's say you have that bowl of tortilla soup. And then you decided, you know what? I'm going to add some Drano in here, and I'm going to put some liquid plumber in here, and I'm going to get some cyanide, and I'm going to stir it all up. And I come into the kitchen, and I go, oh, my goodness, tortilla soup. I'm ready to eat. And you're like, Phil, don't go and eat this tortilla soup. You don't, you don't want it. No, no, Phil, seriously, there's consequences if you eat this. Listen, I got a bag of tortilla strips that have been in my pantry since September, and I got to get rid of them before they get stale. And so I want the tortilla so you say, okay, okay, here you go. And I begin to eat it. Man, I love it. I lift that bowl up, lick the bowl even. It's so good. And then all of a sudden, all my insides are burning. Let me ask you, is God punishing me for drinking the tortilla soup or eating the tortilla soup? No. Sin already has the consequences in itself. Because anything that's against God already has the consequences built in. And this is what they're experiencing. In fact, when it says that you're, you will have pain in labor, it's not just having children. It's actually raising children. Because the verse actually says that it's true. It says that, that, that raising a child will be really hard now. You see, this is another one of Satan's half-truths that he he told uh, Eve, he said, you'll be like God. Well, that sounds really good. Be like God. Sign me up. That sounds awesome. But the problem is we're not built to be like God. We're not made from the constitution of our beings to be God. That's why, when, that's why we make a pretty bad God when we try to make ourselves God. Because we're not meant to have those things on us. That's why when we carry them around and not give them to the Lord, that's why it weighs so heavily upon us. And so he says, you'll be like God. And see, what that really means is this. Yeah, Eve, you'll be like God. You'll experience the same pain that God experiences. You'll experience the pain of watching your children make destructive choices. You'll experience the pain of feeling kind of helpless as you watch your kids go down one path that you know is going to cause them pain. You you. You experience the pain of watching your kids kind of thumb their nose at you and say, I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you. You've never done anything for me. Everything I've got, I did it for myself. So Eve, yeah, you'll be like God. Congratulations. It's a half-truth. It's a, it's a lie. Be like God's not all that it would be cracked up to be. That's why there's only one. And, and so we see that as one of the consequences of the fall. The other consequence we see is in the second half of the verse, which I never understood uh, until I really began to dig deep into it. It says, your desire, he says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Right? Some of you, some of you men, that's your life verse, right? I know that's your, as you've got that up on your mirror every morning, you say, no, I'm teasing. And, and some of the men are like, that sounds like an amazing thing. Praise the Lord. I'm all for that. Well, 
the word desire isn't what maybe you think it is. The word desire actually means to manipulate or control. What God is saying is that from now on, women are going to manipulate and try to control men to get their way. It's kind of like my mama used to say, say that, yeah, the man might be the head of the house, but I'm the neck that turns the heads. <laughs> and for men, it says the men will try to rule over women, not just husband and wives, but men will try to rule over women. And by ruling, that's not a loving thing. That's a conquering. That's a sub, subjugating, subduing kind of thing. And often this gets interpreted as a, 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 as a command and not a consequence. Like God was saying, this is the way things ought to be. But that's not at all. See, this isn't a prescription of how things ought to be. It's a description of how things are going to be because of the fall. Because of this, now this is what you've unleashed. God is telling them that from now on relationships are going to be hard. In particular, God's wonderful plan for marriage is going to be reduced to a power struggle between men and women that we're going to see instead of marriage being a dance to be enjoyed, it's going to be a debate to be won. There's going to be, in, in, in all relationships, there's going to be conflict and poor communication and frustration and envy and even in some there's going to be abuse and this is going to cause a lot of tension and see, this is the operating system. This is the program that we've operated with in relationships ever since, isn't it? This is the struggle that men and women and all relationships, friendships, uh, ch father, mother, children, all relationships are going through. Years ago, we were updating some software uh, that had not been updated uh, for a long time. And we, we couldn't get it to work. We couldn't upgrade it. And so we called the company and we said, we've got a problem here. We need to upgrade this software. And they said, well, yeah, you got a problem. They said, because you're operating with version 5 and we're at like version 18. We can't upgrade you. You just have to buy a whole new program and install it. And see, that's exactly what God does. Because you may have noticed I skipped over verse 15. Did you notice that? But verse 15 is the most, one of the most important verses. In fact, it's the most important verse in all of that passage. God says to Satan in verse 15, he's talking to Satan, the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. What does that mean? When I read that, I'm like, I don't know what that means. It means that Satan will hurt a descendant of Eve. Somewhere down the line, Eve's descendant will be hurt by Satan, but that descendant will turn around and destroy Satan. This, friends, is the first, the absolute first prophecy that Jesus is going to come and be our Savior. Here we are on page 4 in the Bible, in Genesis, and God is already unleashing hope for people within 10 verses of mankind's first sin God is already saying that he's going to reverse the curse he's going to handle things he's got it covered God is making it crystal clear to Satan he said he's saying you'll bruise his heel but he'll crush your head in other words Satan is going to do some temporary limited damage to Jesus, that's the cross. But Jesus is going to deal and deliver a permanent damage to Satan. That's the empty tomb. And that's the power, friends, of the resurrection. You see, because what the resurrection means is that we have hope. It's a hope that God has the last word in every situation in every age. That God has it handled. He has the last word over this pandemic. He has the last word over the economy. He has the last word over trouble in relationships. He has the last word. Make no mistake about it. And even for Christians, even if we die, it doesn't matter. Because death doesn't have the last word. God does. You see, death may take you, but death can't keep you. Because when Jesus got up 
after three days of being in the grave. And I'm going to kind of control my preaching, but I'm just going to say it this way. When he got up from the grave and walked out of his tomb, we walked with him. And that means we came out of that grave, and that means our sins are forgiven, and that means we have a way, the door is open to heaven where he will be, and he has prepared a place that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor hearts imagine what God has prepared for those that love him. That's what we have to look forward to. You see, I hear people a lot when you ask them, how you doing? They'll say, well, I woke up on this side of the ground today. You hear anybody say that? Maybe you've said it. And I understand what people mean by that. I get it. But you know, maybe, just maybe we shouldn't say that. Because even if we don't wake up, it's going to be okay. In fact, it's going to be more than okay. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and if, if the number one fear that we have is... Well, actually, you know, did you know the number one fear that people have is public speaking? The number two fear is death. So that means at a funeral, they'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. That's what it means. But you know, if your greatest fear is death, then that ain't a problem anymore. If your greatest problem is death, that's not a problem because Jesus has taken care of that for us. For those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord, he's taking care of it. And that means if he's taking care of death, follow with me. And that's at the top of the list of things, of problems, of fears. Then don't you think he's handled the rest of the list as well? If he can handle that, which nobody comes back from, don't you think he can handle everything down the list don't interpret the presence of problems as the absence of God you see because we had an earthly problem that required a heavenly solution and that's what we come to celebrate at this table today so I'm going to invite you to turn to page 12 in your hymnal in front of you Page 12. We begin with the invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proved God's love for, for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give our thanks and praise. That's my part. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere. It's been a while. It's a, and a joyful thing to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And all say, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. 
Your spirit anointed him to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick and fed the hungry and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of your suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He had gathered with his disciples. And he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks for it, he said, this is a cup of a new and everlasting covenant between God and his people. Drink ye all of this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on the gifts of bread and juice. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ Jesus our Lord, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet, through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Today we celebrate Holy Communion a little differently, but it's still Holy Communion. So I'm going to invite you to come through the middle and go to either side and then come back through the wings to your seat. Each of these has a place for a, a, a cup that has your bread and also your juice. If you'll take one and then we have a, a place to dispense of those at the end. Christ invites all to his table and we celebrate Holy Communion here, which means this is an invitation from Jesus. This table doesn't belong to me or to the temple. It belongs to Christ himself and he invites all who would to come and dine at his table, to join him. For some of you, this may be a time to recommit. And that's maybe what that juice and that bread represents to you, to respond to God's grace for the forgiveness of our sins. For some of us, it may be that we've been worried about that list that I talked about of all the different fears and all the different problems that we had. And maybe this juice and this bread is a reminder that if God has taken care of death, then he's handled everything else too. So would you come right now as the Lord leads?
in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. You know, today, one of the things, if you've been in the Methodist church for any length of time, you, uh, this is a kind of a nervous season, isn't it? Because this is usually when appointments get made. And so, you may have that fear on your list. And I just want you to know you can scratch that fear off. Because <laughs> Dana and I are staying for as long as you would have us. And the only plan we have is to buy a house. So we, we want to be with you. We love you. You're our family. You're our church family. And we love each and every one of you. And we want to stay for as long. I told you I'm a little competitive. And Roger was here for 18. And I got to beat Roger. And I like even numbers. So 20 sounds good. So I got 17 years left. So I got to get healthier. That's all I know. <laughs> so, But we, uh, we're delighted to be here. And so would you stand and let's just give thanks to, the, to God. Thank you, O oh Lord, for what you have done. Lord, you are doing great things in the life of this church. Lord, you work in so many wonderful ways, and you're working through our lives as well. Lord God, we pray. We pray as we leave this place that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we could be the body of Christ in the world wherever we go, that we would spread the love and grace of Jesus as we go. And Lord, be with us. Protect us and watch over us as you do your own children. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. You are dismissed to go. Turn around before you leave and say something to somebody and say, I'm glad you got to come to church with me today. Thank <laughs> you.